Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks for the wonderful introductions, Piyush. Um, once again, I'm Avishek Ratna. I lead product marketing efforts uh, for TensorFlow and uh, multiple open source initiatives, machine learning initiatives at Google. And it's my absolute honor and pleasure to speak alongside Robert Crow. Uh, Robert, I probably would leave the introduction part to you. Uh, I'm, I'm Robert Crow. I'm a developer engineer in the TensorFlow team. Um, and my real focus is on production ML and ML ops and TFX. Um, so this topic is near and dear to my heart. And today we will cover some of the most common questions we get uh, from our practitioner audiences as they think about moving to data centric uh, practices and applied AI. So uh, we thought we'd have structure this more as a conversation where we walk you through some of our thinking uh, around some of the most common themes in data centricity and applied AI. So the first of these questions that we often see coming from our uh, community is that in an age of big data, is the sheer volume of available data the primary determinant of machine learning success? Is more data always better? Maybe I'll start us off here, Robert. And uh, I'd say it's widely understood in the industry that uh, the quality of our data determines the quality of our ML outcomes. Andrew famously demonstrated through multiple experiments that uh, a model centric, -centric approach um, is often exceeded by uh, a data centric approach when it comes to overall quality of outputs. That said, I don't think you'd go very far if you simply focused on quantity of data. Organizations struggle in multiple aspects, um, especially in modern day data engineering practices um, and getting ready for successful AI outcomes. There are three major challenges that I see organizations struggle with. One of them is that it is really hard to maintain high data quality with rigorous validation. The second is, it can be really hard to classify and catalog data assets for discovery. Generally data is produced by one team and then for that to be discoverable and useful for another team, um, it can be a daunting task for most organizations. Even larger, more established organizations struggle with data discovery and usage. The third problem that we see uh, in uh, bringing data to bear fruit for AI uh, outcomes is Organizations increasingly are moving to multi-cloud deployments. At the same time, we are moving in an environment that is very uh, privacy preserving and privacy focused. So a lot of, uh, it's it's becomes very hard to anonymize sensitive data to do AI responsibly in a privacy preserving day, way and to monitor data usage for compliance. So these are so quality validation, discovery, compliance, all need to be solved meaningfully to build a good foundation for successful AI. Robert, what do you think? Well, yeah, that's I, I agree that uh, I agree with everything you said. Um, just looking at the, at the question and thinking about the the idea that the sheer volume is determinant of success. Um, there's there's a lot of aspects to that. First of all, volume itself is is not a good measure because it's really not, uh, I mean, you can have tons of data that is essentially, you know, duplicates or in a very narrow region of the feature space where your your prediction requests cover a much broader region. And in that case, the volume doesn't do you any good at all. Um, so uh, it's certainly not a primary de deterrent. Also machine learning success, that, that concept it, it's more than just the metrics that your model returns. It's it's can you use your model effectively in a in a product or service or, or business process? Then within you know the latency requirements you have, the cost requirements that you have, and so forth. So there's a lot of factors. Really, sheer volume. I, I think where this came about is is when we had the rise of deep learning. There was much vo larger volume of data used, and, and of course we had big data that was driving a lot of that. Um, because we, we found ourselves with these mountains of data, but, um, it's, it's really much more subtle and, and the, the, the important thing here is really the predictive signal in the data. Yeah. 
Absolutely agree, Robert. That's the signals and data is kind of what uh, will determine success more than just the quantity. And that uh, leads us to our second question, which is models learn to ignore or devalue features that don't improve the model's ability to learn. So does that mean feature selection is no longer necessary? If not, when should we consider using feature selection? Robert, maybe you can lead that one. So um, I, I have had ML engineers tell me that you didn't need to do feature selection anymore and that you could just throw everything at the model and it will figure out you know, what to keep and what to throw away, which is true, except it's also incredibly wasteful and, and expensive. So um, the idea, I mean, the, the model will zero out the, the, the features and, and signals that it doesn't need, but you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of, a lot of effort collecting that data in general. Um, the other thing is it's going to make the, the model much more complex just computationally complex than it needs to be. So, um, yeah, I'm a big I'm a big fan of feature selection to try to try to craft your data, and it, it leads you to understanding your data better too, and, and leads to you know better uh, understanding to 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 do your feature engineering around that. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm a big fan of feature selection. Yeah. I, I would echo what you were saying, Robert, like the complexity grows exponentially as we start adding more and more features. Um, it's expensive, it's time consuming, but one more thing to think about here is just how complex is it to even access that data. If you are at a large or even mid-sized organization, chances are you're spending a lot of time uh, stuck behind fairly time consuming processes to get access to data. The more data you process, to get your features. Uh, the more features means more data consumed upstream and data quality and breakage and lineage issues, all these things happen at the back end, which means that you could run into, uh, you could possibly be working with stale data or broken data or data that's out of compliance or data that's biased and you would never know. So I feel it's very important for organizations to trim the number of features they need to like the absolute uh, absolutely necessary ones, and then ensure that they have the governance and the quality checks in place to make sure that the data they use for building features are fresh. So I think feature selection is an enabler of uh, quality outcomes in machine learning. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good point, especially in in areas like you know uh, PII or or healthcare or so forth where gathering those features is is not just expensive but but sensitive yeah absolutely that actually brings us to a good point too like uh, a large percentage of ml projects are based on supervised learning which are very dependent on good feature selection but then uh, robert what do you think are some of the challenges supervised uh, you know production applic uh, like up um uh, applied folks in the supervised learning space face uh, when trying to productionize these use cases? Well, like a lot of machine learning, the big, the big problem is the data. Getting, getting data that has the predictive signal that you need. And in supervised learning, it has to be labeled data. So uh, you're, you're going to need to be able to label you know, a decent sized data set. And it's very domain dependent. So for some things where you know you're getting data from a click stream that's pretty much automatically labeled, that's great. Um, th that that tends to be you know sort of low hanging fruit, uh, and you can use that sort of thing. In other areas, uh, like you know looking at a uh, an X ray and and deciding whether it shows a broken bone or not, you're going to need a medical professional to label each of those images. Um, which is, you know, very expensive and slow and, and time consuming. So um, there's also all the problems that you have with the data and concept drift uh, with supervised learning. There are some some things that you can apply to, to try to uh, improve the situation. Um, one of which is weak supervision, which which Snorkel is kind of famous for. So I'm sure in the conference probably uh, 
you've heard a lot about weak supervision uh, and other techniques like like synthetic data and so forth. Um, but that's that's the you know the big challenge, especially for supervised learning, is getting data with the right predictive signal and getting those labels. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll echo, you kind of covered uh, the most important talking points there, Robert, but like I think if I was to summarize this, I see three challenges um, to, um, it's just not just the effort that's involved in labeling data and creating these expensive data sets. The actual, um, outside of that, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in terms of processes and organizational readiness, making sure that internal processes support access and sharing of high quality data sets that can be used for machine learning. So a lot of organizations are not there yet. So um, like you pointed out the healthcare examples, um, it can take months to get the right data set for machine learning by when the industry has changed. And so the outcomes are meaningless at that point. Uh, building and sourcing data, you kind of talked about bias as well. So I think that's a big challenge too. A lot of times the data sets may have a lot of inherent bias in the way they were created and bias labeling leads to bias results. And the third challenge really is around privacy and truly uh, running privacy preserving AI practices can be hard, especially with the rise of uh, uh, regulations like GDPR, HIPAA, or CCPA. It may, you may very well be faced with like legal barriers to accessing some data points which are deemed, um, uh, deemed sensitive or uh, for frankly legal. So all of those, um, things add up and make supervised learning more challenging. And I kind of like what Robert mentioned too, that it's a good segue to the next question. We, What we're seeing is access to quality data sets is always challenging, but are there best practices to achieve meaningful results with limited labor data or low access to quality data? And uh, I can get us started here. I think Robert talked about two principles. Uh, one of them is synthetic data. And um, we definitely see a lot of um, a growth in that area, um, especially when it comes to computer vision, especially when it comes to industrial robotics and those areas where deep generative models and neural networks can study the distribution of quality samples of data, which could be small in size, but then they could use that sampling, they could use that distribution to create larger data sets with artificially introduced uh, samples uh, and in fact, in some cases, synthetic data could actually be better than real data because it can eliminate a lot of uh, glaring outliers, um, which can skew the outcomes to potentially biased results. And the other area that uh, Robert mentioned was weak supervision. So I'd love to learn a little more about that, Robert. Yeah, so uh, weak supervision is... Uh... It's the idea of using uh, the domain expertise that you have um, to create uh, labeling functions which apply probabilistic labels to your data. So by doing that, you can create a signal and, and uh, usually pre-train your model um, and bring it up to the point where you can apply a small amount of data to do the final uh, fine tuning for your model. It's it's very similar to how you use a pre-trained model. In, well, it's very similar in some ways to how you use a pre-trained model uh, and then apply fine tuning for a particular domain, which is another good technique when you have a limited amount of data. If you can find a pre-trained model that is you know close enough to what you're trying to do, uh, you know, especially in things like vision uh, or uh, like, you know, question and answering or language models, um, those, those tend to be pretty good for, for applying limited amounts of data. So people are learning to kind of adapt to, to where the opportunities are and, and what the realities of their data are uh, to try to try to deal with issues like this. Yeah. You brought up a really good point around large language models and, uh, I believe there's also a question from Vasisht on the same topic. So this is interesting uh, because there've been so many inspiring advances with large language models or LLMs, such as Lambda or Palm. Uh, what are some of the challenges of applying large language models in production use cases? Um, I Yeah, if you wanna get us started, Robert, that'll be great. 
Um, so, uh, well, one of the, I mean, the big problem is just the size. So these are, these are large models that are expensive to run. And so that really limits the use cases that you can use them for. They, they need to be high value use cases. Um, so then there's a lot of effort being, being done to try to take the large model versions of things and trim them down to a much smaller version that can be run in a, you know, a broader selection of use cases like edge deployments, for example, or mobile deployments. Uh, but even in server-based deployments, just just trying to you know maximize the 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 usage of the model by decreasing the cost. But there's a number of other just in terms of the models themselves, uh, things like accuracy for retrieval-based models and 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 so forth. Um, bias uh, is it is the model returning a result that is uh, is is novel or is it just you know, returning a sort of a canned response. All those things come into play, but usually at the level of, of the larger model development itself. So we're getting into a into a situation where we're having these developments of large models that then need to be sort of uh, changed and fine tuned into particular domains and much much smaller um, amounts of compute resources. Right. I, I really like that. I think I think of two challenges uh, uh, in addition to everything that you shared, Robert. I mean, kind of echoing some of what you said. One of the ch challenges really is about how these large language models were created. While these models demonstrate state-of-the-art results, even in few short applications, there often is a lot of bias in the way that data was collected. And that bias kind of propagates itself in transfer learning or through downstream application. So uh, one challenge really is to how do we do transfer learning with carefully pruned data sets. And the second thing is the just the logistics of deployment itself. Um, a typical inference, uh, for example, a simple question like, how tall is the president of the United States can be built up of like this task can be decomposed into multiple tasks. For example, finding out the named entities, figuring out the database IDs for the named entities, um, you know, deciding the appropriate UI to render the answer and then do the inferencing or the um, uh, estimation itself. That All of that uh, requires a lot of pipeline tasks. And when you have a large language model sitting in the pipeline and that inferencing, then debugging uh, becomes difficult. Retraining the model becomes difficult. So there are lots of uh, practical challenges with directly working with large language models um, in this case. And then um, one of the questions that we also see, and I think the last question before we move to Q&A, is about the topic of change. Robert, you talked about drift and bias. And how do models adapt to change, changes in the world around them? In a production use case, how should developers think about change? So change is one of the two, in my view, one of the two major drivers for MLOps. It, it's, there's change in the world and then there's process. So applying production level processes. Um, change is, is true for models just like it's true for humans. So depending on what, what area you're talking about, things can change very slowly or they can uh, change at a uh, uh, you know, much faster pace. For example, in medicine, there can be new techniques all the time or new results, new treatments. Uh, in law, there's constant changes in law. In markets, there's constant change. Your model, just like a human, needs to learn to adapt to that. And that means it needs new data to adapt to that because every training data set you gather is just a snapshot in time of whatever that, that data was gathered. So it, that's as much as the model knows about. It doesn't know about anything that's newer than that. Um, that said, it's it's really domain domain dependent. Um, so so some things uh, like language models, language doesn't change all that fast. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that. But no, um, I please go ahead. And I, I think uh, it will also be nice to take some of these audience questions that I'm seeing. Yeah, Robert, Abhishek, that was a, a great presentation. Thanks so much for uh, walking us through that. Um, Abhishek, I think you guys got to one of Vashish's questions, but I see a question from Rahul on how do you speed up gathering data, uh, the labeling process, um, and just kind of up level, you know, everything around you know, data labeling? Would you, I mean, I know Snorkel has an answer to that as well, but would love to hear from you all on, on kind of where you see that. Yeah, well, again, I'd say it's very domain dependent. Uh, you know, I, I've I've been parts of projects where we've spent an incredible amount, amount of t uh, money just trying to collect a small amount of data. Uh, but in other cases, I mean, if you can automate as much as you can automate, the better you are. So uh, taking advantage of weak supervision, taking advantage of synthetic data, data augmentation, all those things can, can really help. If you can establish some sort of a feedback for your process where you're getting your data labeled as part of you know, serving your model, um, that's, that's good too. It, it just, it really depends very, very dependent on the problem that you're solving and the domain that you're working in. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we'd all agree that iteration is is key, especially as things drift and change over time. Yeah. Um, so we have a question from Andrew here uh, about one obstacle to sharing data, even within a single organization, is that so much information about the data set is documented poorly, if at all. So could you speak to the use of maybe data cards or other techniques for capturing metadata, such as the definitions of features, how the data was sourced, assumptions implicit in the distribution? Yeah, Robert, you can go first. I have a certain point of view on this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, th that I mean, that is definitely a problem. It's really as an organization, you often have multiple teams or multiple developers who are working on different things. But it, to the extent that they can share their data uh, and, and, and avoid duplication, it, it really helps. Um, Feature stores can help with that by uh, sort of gathering all, all of your features in one place and making data sets kind of rationalized and they will capture uh, some of the metadata associated with that. Um, things like uh, ML metadata can really help understanding your data over the life cycle of your, your product or service so that you capture the artifacts that are generated, not just data sets, but uh, the rest of the artifacts too, things like metrics and, and, and model results and, and evaluations and so forth. Um, so understanding how your model evolves over time is part of that too. But he's really asking about, I think, the initial data set. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's a lot of governance that has to happen. Yeah. Um, That's that's what I was thinking too, uh, Robert. Like it's the governance aspect, honestly. Sometimes, just unfortunately, have to deal with the bad data set. But um, it really is about bringing that data culture in the organization. If uh, even the best of tools can only go so far if uh, the teams are not committed to making sure that uh, the sanity is in place. So, yeah, I I don't know if there's a silver bullet for like uh, you know making up for missing data lineage. But all the techniques that you mentioned, Robert, definitely go a long way. And uh, uh, like if you can have feature stores, if you can have um, some sort of automated labeling um, and some sort of automated meta metadata generation, all of that, all those steps go a long way. Yeah, I think you guys are spot on. It's it, it's a, it's something that everyone struggles with, but it's a, it's a team effort and everyone needs to be disciplined in kind of making that happen. Um, we, have an, we have another question that's come in about what are things you focus on in terms of monitoring and observability of the production ML pipelines? What would be the things to focus on first and what tools, tools would you recommend? Robert can speak to this in a lot of detail. So uh, the production ML pipeline is kind of broad. Um, 
it, it covers the training pipeline and, and the serving or inference uh, process as well. So taking those apart, in training, uh, you, you really want to capture information about uh, really the whole pipeline. So it's from the beginning data set through the different transformations you do to your data and the, the information you capture about it through the training process itself in the evaluation process. Um, what we do is, in, in TFX is we use ML metadata as uh, a tool to capture all those steps and it preserves the lineage of all those artifacts. So from the training perspective, that gives you the entire history of that that model and that pipeline um, throughout the life cycle of that product or service, which it might be living for years. Um, on the serving side, really what you want to monitor is things like operational uh, performance, how, you know, how much is your latency, make sure that, you know, someone is alerted when the thing goes down, scaling up, scaling down, that kind of thing, but also capturing, um, and this is really important, capturing the prediction requests that are made of your model, because those will form the basis of your next data set. And then you need a labeling process behind that to take that data and, and get it labeled. Um, but that really tells you, you know, that's your signal from the outside world about how it's using your model and what your model needs to do to, uh, to serve that well. So that's where you start to see data drift. And um, uh, when you get to the labeling part of that, that's when you start to see concept drift. So unfortunately, I think that's all the time we're going to have for questions today. But really quickly, I'd love if you guys could share. If anyone wants to follow along with this work or, or learn more about you know, everything that you've spoken about, what's a good way to either connect with you or, or follow on the work at large? Um, well, tensorflow.org. <laughs> <It's>, Perfect. <laughs> well, well, we'll leave it at that. Tensorflow.org it is. 